So I'm Sonia. Uh, I'm originally from Poland. I grew up in New York City. I now live in Brooklyn with my dog named Cash and husband named Ben. Um, a little bit about my career in product. I joined Etsy in 2010. Um, prior to that, I had worked in um, tech and finance in San Francisco. So we were a little uh, over 80 people when I joined. We're a little over 1,100 now. And somewhere in the middle, we uh, became a publicly traded company. And over the last decade, I've worked on basically every part of the business, uh, seller side, buyer side, B2B, B2C, um, web, native. And so as I was reflecting on my time at Etsy, what I came to realize was um, I changed projects and teams about every 15 months on average. So same company, lots of change. And I actually think this is the truth that binds all product managers. No PM, no two PM career are the same, but I think the only constant is change. And so your job as a product manager requires resilience because nothing ever stays constant. And I think that this is more true now than ever before. And we don't yet know the implications of the global pandemic um, and how that's gonna impact how we wanna spend our time and money. But even before um, COVID, I really wanted to talk about ambiguity because I've always felt like it's kind of the dirty little word in product because your job quite literally is to know. You're supposed to be this all-knowing, ever-seeing creature who has full grasp on past, present, and future. And at any given in time, in time, you're supposed to have a really clear point of view on what are the biggest opportunities, what does a customer need, how you're going to meet those needs, and how that's going to change over time. But here's the truth about product management. Um, sometimes, occasionally, you will have this super well-defined project with really clear success criteria. Mwah, love those. They never happen. Um, occasionally, you'll get a top-down mandate, usually from the CEO, um, who just wants something very specific to, build, to be built. Um, but most of the time, it's totally vague, really unclear, or just totally unknown. And when I talk about ambiguous situations in products, what I'm really referring to is a situation where the causal relationship is unclear, no precedent exists, or the team is facing unknown unknowns. And you might be asking yourself, why is any of this important? And it's because humans really hate uncertainty. Our brains are wired that way, and uncertainty breeds anxiety. And I think this is really amplified for product managers because we really, really hate not knowing. We despise not having the answers and we alleviate that anxiety with this need for closure. And it's ultimately that need for closure that hurts our ability to um, explore bolder solutions and build better products. So let's talk about what to do when you don't know what to do. Um, I don't think anything I'm gonna say tonight is revolutionary, but I do hope that it gives you some tools um, that you can take away in order to find, fight that closure, that need for closure when you're in an ambiguous situation. Um, so you can really build better and bolder products for your customers. So be transparent, set the direction, involve the team and start small. So be transparent. Said differently, this is just keep it real with your team, especially if you have no idea what to do. So be upfront about what you know, but also what you don't know. Of course, you want to give your team all the facts, reassure them, make sure that there's a shared understanding, but focusing on what you don't know can actually be a really powerful tool for your team. Call it like it is. I mean this literally. If it's going to be a roller coaster, use that language. This starts to mentally prepare your team for the twists, turns, potential queasiness, and maybe some thrills ahead. 
Um, and be empathetic. Empathy is really key when you're communicating change and uncertainty. In most cases, what you're telling people is gonna have a very real impact on their personal lives. So share your perspective, create the space um, for them to open up, talk about their fears and concerns. Getting those things out and uh, open early on really lets the team focus on the task at hand moving forward. Um, focus on what you can control. Uh, being a product manager can be super overwhelming. Like that is just the honest truth. There are always a million things that matter, um, but focusing your time and energy on the things you can actually, actually control is really helpful. Um, and obviously you wanna be aware and transparent about the dependencies that you can't control, but focus your time and energy on that little sliver. Okay, set the direction. Remember, your job is not to come up with the best solution. Your job is to identify the best way forward. So set some guardrails. Um, I'm breezing over this part, but this is actually probably the meatiest part of the, of the process. You wanna really define the problem space, the opportunity and the challenge. You can't lead your team to success if you don't have a super good grasp on that, but that's probably like a talk all in on its own. Um, focus on customer outcomes and not features. Once you know what the issue or opportunity is, um, I think it's a great idea to frame it as one sentence from the customer's point of view and make that your team mantra. So at Etsy, um, customer outcomes are a really big part of our product delivery culture. So an outcome statement is a desirable end result your team wants to create. It's expressed from uh, the uh, perspective of the customer and it generates value both for them as well as the business. So an example of this is as an Etsy seller, I'm able to increase my sales by sharing the right information about my products with potential buyers. So it's expressed from a seller's point of view, uh, the measurable, uh, the measure is increased sales and the ability that we wanna try to create is giving them the ability to provide the right information at the right time. And these outcome statements are sort of the, the top block of how we organize our work. Um, they're the big meaty opportunities um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this framework in the start small section, where we really start to break down the opportunity by the proposal of value and then the little hypotheses. So define success. Um, I think deconstructing success and making it really measurable is helpful. The tricky part about ambiguous situations is that it makes the unknown future a really, really scary place. So, if you can paint the picture of what success looks and feels like, if you can bring your team along on that, that journey, um, they can start to visualize a positive future state and it'll alleviate some of the short-term anxiety. And outline noun goals. Um, this is actually a really favorite exercise of mine. You may think that the goals you outlined in your doc are super crystal clear, but it's not until you define what the non-goals are and what you're not trying to do um, that it really starts to uh, create the parameters for your team so they understand uh, where can they explore and where then where can they build. All right, next, involve the team. This feels super obvious because as product managers, um, being a good collaborator is just key to being a good product manager. But I think all too frequently, we feel a lot of pressure to just figure it all out on our own. So before you get started, figure out how you roll. And what I mean by that is, um, I think a lot of projects end up being derailed purely because of differences in people's preferences and working styles. So take the time up front to surface those preferences and start to define what your team's operating rhythm are. Um, so this is an exercise that we do at Etsy all the time. It's super remote friendly. Um, it's great anytime you have a mix of people that are new to working together or you just need to hit the reset button or you've been having a hard time working together. And you basically create this scorecard 
Um, and you want to have each member sort of plot themselves on where they fall on these spectrums. So are they an early bird? Are they a night owl? Do they want to hash things out together or do they need some time to just think alone? Um, do they like email or Slack better? And then have them chart this on how important each one of these things are. Is it super important to them or are they really flexible on it? And this exercise really starts to give you a visualization of everybody's preferred working styles so you can start to map out your team's operating rhythm. Now, uh, now that you know how to work together, you need to create the time in virtual space for ideation. This is where good calendar hygiene is critical. So this is pretty much what every product manager's calendar looks like. There's no time for ad hoc meetings when inspiration strikes. There's no time for like deep thinking about the future. Um, and there's certainly no time to do physical, tangible work during regular business hours. So I encourage all of you to audit your calendars um, remove meetings that could just be a Slack or an email. There's a lot of them. Um, and if you want to be really aggressive, start uh, declining meetings that don't have agendas. Big fan of that. And I also encourage you all to talk with your teams and establish some no meeting times that you just block off on all of your calendars. So either a chunk of time during the day or a full day that you can all align and commit to trying not to schedule meetings. This certainly isn't perfect, but it goes a really long way. And my pro tip here is that you wanna make that time sound really important, like long-term strategic planning or something like that. And then other people will be less inclined to um, schedule over it. Now, once you have the time, you need the space, um, we are operating in a whole new world. So it's all about virtual meetings and workshops now. Um, I'm happy to plug Miro boards. We've been using them for a while now. We actually used them well before the stay at home orders. Um, I think that it's actually a really great way to have a digital archive of all the little sticky notes and worksheets and boards and things that you normally use uh, whiteboards and markers for and then take a picture and then have to transcribe it. Um, this is a really great way to just do it all digitally. And I hear that they have some nice new uh, integrations with Slack and Jira and Confluence and Trello. So I'm pretty happy there. And don't forget to think divergently. This is sort of inherently built into product teams. You have so many different perspectives and point of views. Um, and really leverage that. Make sure that you're reaching out to every single perspective in person and giving them the space and the time to open up. Some people just aren't big talkers, they're not loud, they're maybe introverts, and it's your job as a product manager to make sure that everybody feels comfortable and you're pulling all of that information out of them. Plus, most people or most companies, you have access to a lot of other really smart and awesome people who have a totally different perspective. So bring those folks in too, rely on them. And if you're not talking to your customer support people, you are really, really missing out because they have all the gold. And empower decision-making. Um, this one was always really hard for me as a product manager because I wanted to have all the control, but I think you will be pleasantly surprised at the amazing outcomes that your team comes to on their own if you just empower decision-making and it saves you some time. So start small. Um, <laughs> sorry, Tim's back. So when I say start small, I, what I really mean is that you wanna take all of your ideas and break them down into tiny, tiny chunks. And this is awesome because it allows you to experiment really quickly. So I mentioned this before, um, part of the hierarchy of how we break up our work at Etsy is the top level are these outcomes, the big meaty opportunities that we've identified. Then below that, we have proposals of value, um, which are really your potential solutions on how you're going to deliver that um, customer outcome. And then below that, we have our tiny little hypotheses. 
And these are the small bets, small changes that you can make relatively quickly to gain confidence that your idea is generally going in the right direction and that your solution is potentially going to help that customer in the end. So if you do all of this, it really means that you have to start to embrace short term strategies. Um, admittedly, this is harder said than done. Most companies build 12 month roadmaps, part of your annual operating planning. Maybe you need a multi year strategy. Um, so this was a pretty big shift in our delivery culture. Um, it took a lot of buy in from leadership. It took a lot of trust. Um, but I think that it's actually proven to be wildly successful for us. So we shifted from 12 month roadmaps to multi quarter strategies. Um, and I think what's really critical with this way of working is that you, you need to be super, super clear on what you're doing right now. It has to be really well defined and detailed. What you're doing next can be a little hand wavy, but you have a pretty good sense of what's coming up. And then what you're doing later is admittedly pretty, pretty hand wavy and it's probably going to change. But every quarter you're adapting and you're adjusting and you're, you're switching what you're going to be doing now, next and later. And celebrate the victories. So this is extremely important um, during ambiguous situations and when there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, accomplishments early on um, are really important. So celebrate them no matter how small it is. Uh, if a tiny experiment ended up being neutral and you anticipated it would be negative, awesome, send an email to everyone. Uh, if you were just able to release code quickly one day, awesome, congratulate everyone, send an email. Um, you want to make it really, really clear to your team and also to the entire company that the people on the team are extremely critical in the, and vital in, to the success of the project. So to summarize, um, wow, I blew through this. Uh, when in doubt, be transparent, set the direction, involve the team, and start small. And what I just want to leave you all with is a reminder that leadership is not static. Um, it's constantly changing. And a social scientist by the name of Miguel Escotet identified four qualities that are really key in um, someone's ability to manage ambiguity. Um, and those are being self-critical, being curious, being flexible, and risk embracing. So as a homework assignment, I urge all of you to take a step back and really do some self-assessing on how you rank against all of these things um, and figure out where you want to focus so you can be a great product leader. And that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Sonia. My pleasure. Um, looks like a bunch of you have already found the Q&A tab, um, which is awesome. So what we'll do is um, Sonia's going to pull that up and um, we'll try to take as many questions as we can in the next 25 minutes or so. Um, so please uh, add your questions to the Q&A and we'll, we'll try to work through them. Should I just read from them? Yeah, I think it'd be useful just to okay. like, read the question. Okay. Uh, from Elena Berger. Hi, Elena. Um, do you have any tips on communicating to stakeholders outside of your team during times of uncertainty, whether it be your roadmap, product strategy, discovery goals, etc.? So I think um, storytelling is extremely important in a lot of these cases, and it's a big part of um, how you get leadership comfortable with focusing on short-term strategies. It's being able to tell that overarching narrative of where you're going. So I think focusing on really um, comprehensive storytelling is a, is a step in that direction. I also think that visual storytelling, especially in these times when they can't like touch and feel things, goes a really long way. So I always try to work with um, our design partners on creating some visual provocations. They're not anything we will ever <laughs> build, but it kind of gives leadership and people around the company some idea of where we're trying to go. 
Um, I think the other thing uh, I would say is focusing on the questions you need to answer is always really helpful. So we sometimes use a framework called a questions-based roadmap, and it's basically telling leadership, these are the things we need to answer every single month in order to move the project forward. Um, so having them focus on um, the questions and getting the answers to those questions rather than like the feature you're gonna build um, always seems to, to help people gain a little bit more confidence in the plans. Cool, anonymous. Um, so in an ambiguous environment, how do you manage, make, uh, how do you manage making commitments to stakeholders and getting buy-in for initiatives? Um, so, I mean, I think it's pretty similar to the last response. I think when it comes to um, stakeholders, whether it's leadership that needs to like green light a project or it's another counterpart at the, in the company, um, it's about that like storytelling that is emotional and customer focused. So I think anytime you start to talk about buttons and features and pages and screens, that's where everything gets lost and people just like don't wanna do that. Um, and focusing instead on the questions you need to answer in order to drive everything forward um, seems to help align people on what needs to happen next. Um, okay. Anonymous, can you give example of non-goals? Ooh, yeah. So um, a goal for a project might be to, I don't know, increase seller adoption of a feature. Um, one way to do that might be to get more sellers onto the platform. And by virtue of having more sellers, you will get more people to adopt that feature. But that might not be an actual goal. So you shouldn't focus on getting a ton of more sellers onto the platform. You wanna focus, a non-goal is more seller adoption, for example. And so that helps the team understand that they're actually really working with the constraints of the people who are already using the product and on the platform rather than opening up the top of the funnel. Um, Kate Skibinski, fellow Polo Akai, um, in a now next later culture, um, how do you set KPIs? How do you measure success using quantitative and or qualitative measures? Yeah, so um, I don't think the now, next, later culture uh, changes uh, our KPI or metric setting at all. Um, we, we set KPIs up front and they generally stay true um, all the way through later. What the now, next, later framework really helps people do is um, stay focused on the near term and those things that we have a ton of clarity on rather than the long term because honestly, North Stars will change. And I think that was like a a thing that was really hard for me to get over as a product manager and also communicate to stakeholders is that that future state that we're describing is probably gonna change how it looks and feels, but what we're all rallying behind is um, the, the customer outcome that we wanna deliver. So we use both qualitative and quantitative. We have a really, really strong uh, A-B testing culture, so we don't do anything on the site without it being an a B experiment. Um, even if we anticipate it's going to be neutral, there's a ton of data we can gather from an experiment and see the impact we're having. Um, I think the other thing about setting KPIs is that really early on you need to have like the, the overarching metric that the team can rally around and switching that every quarter is actually really confusing to folks. So there should be a really strong case for why you're changing KPIs and maybe it's we moved that KPI but it didn't have the outcome we anticipated. Um, but otherwise I think sticking to the, to the KPIs you set up front is really helpful. Um. I hope everyone is also having happy hour with me. Okay, how do you empower decision making? Any tips to balance taking the ownership versus being democratic? Ooh, so Tim will tell you that this is actually the, the thing I had the hardest time with, especially when I transitioned from being an individual comp uh, contributor to being a manager. Um, and I think that uh, it's really on 
you to, to be comfortable with letting go of that control um, and making it really clear to the team that they have the power to just go off without you. Um, and so setting that expectation really early on to say, hey, if you come up with something, go test it and come back and let me know if it works. And remember that just because they don't do it exactly how you would have done it doesn't mean it's wrong and i think getting comfortable with that really helps you um, set those expectations that it's totally okay to just go on without you let's see danielle pearson what do you do when you your management and cross-functional teams all have conflicting goals and you are still trying to define the basics of the product woof Okay, so I feel like you guys need to start with the how we roll exercise and just like set some basic expectations. And um, the great thing about that exercise is it can be used um, as a way to define personal preferences and working styles, but it can also be a great way to surface like where people's heads are at in the product or the business. So maybe doing an exercise of what do you think is most critical to the business? What do you think customers need more or less of? Um, what are we hearing from changes in like the competitive landscape? Is that scary? Is it not scary? But try to really pull out from everybody where their concerns and where their expectations are. I think the point about having conflicting goals is really tough. Um, it happens sometimes, definitely. Sometimes product teams have different goals. Uh, we have one team who's trying to increase um, save rates or favoriting rates, while another team is trying to improve um, add to cart rates. And those two things can be at, at, at odds and ends sometimes. And that's where I think um, experimentation really comes into play because um, the numbers do the talking for you. And it's not about personal preferences, but it's about what's going to have the biggest impact for the business um, at the end of it. Oh my God, I can't read these half, fast enough. Um, do you have any strategies for encouraging and or helping high level stakeholders outline their desired outcomes for products that are exceedingly ambiguous? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, we usually, um, we usually start with a stakeholder interview. So uh, what that might look like you know, if you hear from somebody like your CPO wants you to take bigger bets, uh, what bigger bets mean to me might be very different than what they mean to her. Um, so early on, getting an understanding of what do you actually mean by that? Um, why is this important to you? Um, help them articulate that. That's helpful. There's a whole slew of exercises that we sometimes do during discovery, um, like root cause analysis, um, Oh my gosh, I can't even think of any more right now. Um, Tim, what are some other ones? What do we do in discovery? Oh my God, my team's gonna kill me. <laughs> uh, to get stakeholders to, to voice what they're thinking? Yeah, during discovery. We have like this whole this whole toolkit of exercises, and I've just completely blanked on them. Um, I mean, journey mapping is is useful. Journey mapping. To... Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> journey mapping. Um, so I think we we tend to do a lot of the sort of discovery and figuring out what we think about the customer, what we know about the customer, how we understand the customer's needs. We sort of do that in a silo and then we wrap it all up with a bow and present it to leadership and hope that it aligns with what they're thinking about. But bringing leadership in early in that process, it's a little bit messy, but it actually gets you to understand what are like the things behind the things they're saying. Um, and that helps us really reframe and reposition what we're going to be doing, knowing if it's aligned with what they want to do and what they think. Storytelling, how can you improve in this area? Um, time, practice, talking out loud, recording yourself, um, and grounding it all in the customer. I think the best way to tell the story is from the customer's perspective, um, how they feel, where they experience it, how it changes their day-to-day -day after they interact with the product, whatever that might be. Um, that really helps 
create the narrative. And then you add some visuals in there and it really starts to paint this full picture. So um, I think practice with storytelling, um, take the product, deconstruct it. And then my, my personal uh, tip is um, do the mom check. So I try to tell my mom what I'm working on. And if she understands it, then I'm getting in the right direction. If she looks at me like, that's all, then, then I know that I need to go back to the drawing board and, and try a little bit harder. Um, let's see. Can you walk through the opportunity outcome and proposal of value slide again? I can. Let's see here. Do you guys see that slide now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is this is part of the product delivery culture at Etsy. So this is basically how we build products. Um, and how we break our work down. So those outcomes, um, those are those customer statements that we talked about early on. Those are like the big meaty areas of opportunity where if you solve it for a customer, there's gonna be some really amazing value for them and, and for the business. Um, and then below that, we have the POVs or potential solutions. We call them proposals of value. So this might be a way to deliver on that customer outcome. Um, and the, we, this is like where solution ideation really comes into play. You come up with a bunch of different ways how you might be able to solve that customer problem. And then you break that down even further to say, how do we prove if this solution that we think is great is actually on the right track? And this is where you wanna break it down into tiny, tiny little changes that you can test really quickly, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, in order to get signal on whether that solution you have in the back of your head is the right one. So this might be something as simple as uh, making copy bolder in certain places. So you start to get signal on, do people care about this? Did it draw their attention to this? Did they click more on this? And then further up the funnel, okay, well, if people care about bolder copy, then maybe this is the right thing to build and then we'll go further down that track. That was a horrible example, but you get it. Let's see, um, in ambiguous environments, how do you manage making commitments to stakeholders and getting buy-in for initiatives? Where am I waiting? Yeah. Um, so I think if it's for a new project, um, at a high level, it's rallying around that customer outcome, uh, how you're gonna measure success, bringing them along, along on the ride for what success is gonna look like both for the customer and for the business. Um, and then working backwards to say, here are all of the open questions we have that we need to answer in order in order for us to be able to articulate what we're gonna build, right? Because that's the problem. A lot of the time we, we have like a million questions that we need to answer both about the business, the customer, whatever it might be before we start to define what the product is gonna look like. Um, and so that's where focusing on outcomes rather than on features is really helpful. I think when we focus on features, uh, we end up just managing roadmap boards and the leadership just asks when is a feature launching and nobody really cares about what's happening to the customer. So again, just um, telling the story of what you're gonna deliver, what that future state might look like uh, is helpful. How do we get this deck? Can I share this deck? I feel like I can share this deck. Yeah, I will find a way to share this deck afterwards. Uh, the recording will also be available for everyone uh, as soon as tomorrow. Um, but, but I'll sync with Tim if there's a way for me to share this out. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, we'll do that. Cool. Um, how do you work with short-term strategies without outlining the long-term vision? It doesn't feel like you are working on very incremental features. Um, I think it can at times feel like you're working on incremental features, but that's where that North Star comes into play. So you always want to have a vision of the future that you're working towards. It's just that that doesn't need to be defined by the features that you're going to build. Um, it needs to be defined by um, the value you're going to be creating. So I think it's still 
about working towards something. It's just knowing that that something, how it looks and feels and, and tastes is gonna change over time and being okay with that because you thought you were headed in this direction, but as you worked through your experiments and through your POVs and uh, started to delivering on that customer outcome, um, it starts to pivot in a totally different way. From Vineet, with ambiguity come conflicts. Any tips on how to organize around resolving uh, frameworks? Man, I think, I think being really direct with people is super helpful and creating the space to understand why something is not working. I think conflict resolution is probably one of the uh, most important things about being a people manager. And that's true for product managers because even though we don't have folks reporting into us. We are managing a lot of people's day-to-day -day work lives and that has implications for their personal lives. So um, I try to just be upfront and understand what's happening and is it something personal at home and has nothing to do with the project? Is it the project itself? Is it me? I don't know, whatever it is, but try to really pull out and suss out what's what's happening there that's creating that conflict and then just put a plan into action to say, hey, we're gonna either work around these things, find a different way to work. Um, I know that that's usually easier said than done, but um, I think talking to people directly or via Zoom, unfortunately, uh, is really helpful in, in pulling those things out. Hmm. What is your project prioritization approach and any tips on how to say no in a way that's transparent and inclusive? Ooh, this is such a good product manager one. I always say that like 99% of a product manager's job is saying no, but figuring out a w nice way to say it. Um, so I don't know that I uh, have nailed the transparent and inclusive part of this, um, but I think um, saying maybe instead of no is great um, because one, it opens up the space for both of you to talk about why they want something uh, specific, um, doesn't close the door completely, um, and there's usually a but there. So like, no, we can't, but using maybe usually helps the, the conversation be uh, directed in a more positive light. Um, whew. I think I'm going to have to answer some of these uh, via text. Yeah, well, all the questions we don't answer, I can download and send to you. And when we post the recording and everything, if there's more you want to answer, then we can definitely do that as well. Okay, great. Um, given, I given this has been a question marathon, maybe let's take two more. And, okay. then, and then wrap things up, because I'm sure uh, it's draining. <laughs> uh, we do have one that came through the chat uh, that said, for those starting a PM role, what advice do you have to build the strong relationships with a team while not in person? Oh, yeah. Um, gosh, that's super hard. I don't have um, a ton of experience. I will say that I have had um, a couple of reports start recently and they are leading uh, all remote teams now. Some of them haven't even been in the Etsy office yet. Um, so something that we really try to work through is, I mean, Zoom happy hours, uh, casual coffee chats. We as a team have uh, half a, uh, 20 minutes every single morning blocked off for just PM coffee time. Join if you can, skip it if you can't. Um, but just creating spaces for people to be able to meet and talk about non-work things and like, oh my God, non-COVID things is really helpful. I know that's uh, pretty tough sometimes, especially with folks that are introverts and just don't naturally uh, wanna talk. Zoom situations can be a little bit awkward. Um, so I think that there's also games you can play. Uh, there's like some Q and A that you can do. Um, I like to do a, um, we do icebreakers all the time and icebreakers can also be a little bit awkward and uncomfortable. So sending the icebreaker question out in advance is helpful. Like, um, what's your favorite subway station in New York and why? 
that gets like really good <laughs> details about a person's psyche and what they're into. So just think about, you know, questions that you might want to uh, build off of, send them out in advance and then create some space and time, but um, also highly uh, recommend the how we roll exercise. And one more. Um, Oh, there's a bunch about Etsy sellers. Oh, I'll take one of these. Um, what are you doing to help your sellers with so much uncertainty in the economy? Um, what has worked well for you and what has not? Um, so sellers are really the life and blood of our company. Um, everything we do is for um, sellers. So when you know the situation started, um, a, a big thing that the company did was really invest heavily in um, offsite marketing on behalf of our sellers. So uh, we invested $5 million in offsite ads in order to uh, further drive traffic to sellers. Um, we've also been working with sellers and adjusting our strategies and our, our features to make sure that they're able to manage orders at bulk, um, that they're able to have more visibility into what buyers are searching for during this time so they can either pivot their shops or accommodate those needs. Um, so I think a lot has been working well. I think it's just about being extremely sensitive to people's personal situations when we're thinking about um, changes we're making um, and making sure that at the end of the day, they have everything they need because this, this um, paycheck really is more critical now than ever before. And so we want to make sure that we're helping them uh, grow and scale their businesses um, on Etsy. Oh, my husband just arrived. <laughs> Sonia, thank you so much. Um, so many questions. Thank you all for engaging with the, with the topic. I know we didn't get to all of them, um, but if there's a chance, we'll, um, we'll potentially answer more uh, when we post the, the video. Uh, but in all, can all honesty, don't hold us to that because there's a lot going on in the world and especially at Etsy. Um, so we'll do our best, but uh, certainly not, not promising anything on Sonia's behalf. Um, so as, as, we, as we do in person, um, we wanna make these events as useful as possible for you. Um, so after this, you can expect um, to get an email from us just asking for your feedback. Um, you know, the, the, the feedback you give us really goes into to the future speaker topics as well as how we can make um, these events hopefully more useful and hopefully a little bit more fun, especially while we're remote. Um, so on that vein, the next month's talk will be 30 minutes earlier. Um, for folks on the East Coast, hopefully that's a little bit easier um, to, to wrangle an evening around rather than kind of the, the seven to eight window. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and we might iterate a little bit more. Um, but a preview of the next talk um, will be on, well, the talk will be on June, wait, wait, June 17th um, with Tommy Forstrom, who is VP of product at Teachable. Um, before that, he was a, um, a product leader at Shutterstock. Um, and he's going to be touching on a really interesting topic around how to earn your seat at the executive table as a product person. Um, we're all often very good product people and making the jump from thinking about product day in, day out to thinking about the business day in, day out um, is, is often really challenging. And he's going to share some learnings and some insights um, from that. So really looking forward to that one. And hopefully you'll all be able to join us on the 17th. But with that, Sonia, thank you again so much. Pleasure to have you. Um, hope you all enjoyed it and hope to see you all back here next month. Thanks, everyone.